Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and joining me today is the one and only Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Today's interview with Leonard Wong takes on the tough but critically important topic of dishonesty in the Army profession. Absolutely. And the audit culture within the Army that Leonard discusses during this interview is not just found within the military, but also in places such as large academic and corporate environments. I actually found myself nodding in agreement with a lot of his statements, thinking about other organizations that I've observed over the years with the same culture. Yes, Leonard should be commended for addressing this topic in a sensitive and thoughtful way. Before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all of the wonderful five-star reviews positively piling up on iTunes. And as we've announced in previous episodes, this Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews with an eye towards selecting the wittiest and most lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. As always, if you hear your reviews read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Very cool shirt, too. It is. I have several. Today, our winning review... How did you get several? (laughs) Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the nickname CC Rider, entitled Intelligent Podcasting. What a relief. And here is the winning five-star review. What a pleasure to hear intelligent, articulate people discussing worthwhile topics. Yeah, thanks, CC Rider, and that's a great name. And thank you to all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk get off to such a great start. Okay, and now on to today's interview with Leonard Wong. Leonard Wong is a research professor in the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College. His research focuses on the human and organizational dimensions of the military and includes topics such as leadership development and the military profession. He is a retired Army officer whose career included teaching leadership at West Point and serving as an analyst for the Chief of Staff of the Army. His research has led him to locations such as Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo, Bosnia, and Vietnam. All garden spots. He has testified before Congress, and his work has been highlighted in the media such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New Yorker, CNN, NPR, PBS, and 60 Minutes. He is a professional engineer and holds a bachelor's degree from the U.S. Military Academy and a master's and Ph.D. in business administration from Texas Tech University. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, this is Don Cornegas, and I'd like to welcome today Lenny Wong to the podcast. Lenny, welcome. Thanks. Pleasure yeah. to be here. Yeah, and I'd also like to welcome my co-host for today and the director of IHMC, Dr. Ken Ford. Well, thank you, Don. It's great to be here with you. Lenny, you're a uh, research professor in the Strategic Studies Institute at the Army War College. Could you talk a little bit about the college and its role in missions? Sure. The uh, United States Army War College is a uh, it's one part of the uh, Army's professional military education. When I say that, Uh, in the army, because we have no lateral entry, we have to grow our own leaders. And so our leaders come from within. So we have to develop leaders. And that starts when they first come into the army and uh, they first encounter a three month course on teaching them their branch, how to be an engineer, how to be a cyber warrior, how to be infantrymen. Then after about four years, they go off and learn some more about their branch because now they're going to get more responsibility. About nine to 10 years in the army, they'll go off to something we call intermediate level education where they learn how to look at the operational level of war. At the Army War College, we take them up and get them around this 20th year. They're so you're talking 40 something year olds and they learn the strategic level of war, how to lead. They've already led organizations. They already led units. Now, how do you lead the nation? How do you work at the Department of the Army level and uh, how to be strategic about uh, applying all the, uh, the influences, the diplomatic, the informational, the military and the economic? So, Lenny, our primary topic today is a study that you and your colleague Steve Garris conducted on dishonesty in the Army profession. So why did you decide to conduct this study? 
Well, the study actually started uh, over a decade ago. I did a study. Uh, the chief of staff of the army was wondering as he was troubled by the lack of innovation in junior officers in the army. And uh, he thought it was because we had put too many requirements on them, that their lives were completely consumed by executing what everyone else told them to do. And because of that, they had no time to be independent, no time to be innovative, no time to be creative. And so our task at the Army War College uh, was to uh, figure out how to build back time into their calendars. And so that was my task I did over a decade ago. What we found was that the reason we uh, don't have that leeway is because, uh, well, we actually tabulated all the hours of required training, the re hours of required exercises that we make them do. And we tallied up 297 training days, but the problem is we only have about 256 available days. And so we literally overwhelmed them. So that was a study done about a decade ago. I put that one away, it was called Stifling Innovation. But always in the back of my mind, there was the question, well, wait a minute, if we require of them to do literally more than they can possibly do, what are they reporting? Because the army doesn't allow you to say we didn't do it. And so there's a little disconnect there. It's how could you be overloaded with requirements and yet nobody is saying I didn't do it? And so that sat with me for a long time. And uh, I decided to resurrect it when I was sitting with my colleague, Steve Garris, and uh, we were just having a conversation. And uh, he said, somehow it came up and he says, well, you know, I never lie. You can ask anybody, I don't lie, I don't lie to my wife. It's one thing I'm very proud of. And then I said, so what are you doing right now at your PC? And he says, I'm doing mandatory training. And I said, well, you're not really doing mandatory training. And he said, I know, I'm just saying I did it. And I said, well, don't you think that's lying? And he says, no, this isn't lying. This is uh, doing mandatory training. And then we had a little discussion. I said, well, this is funny because this is what I've been thinking about for over a decade on how casually we approach uh, lying, but we don't call it lying. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. So for this study, what methodology did you use and did you model it after other studies that have been conducted? Well, the theory comes from, uh, it comes from, a, there's a book called Blind Spots by Max Bazerman and Ann Tenbrussel. And then she also did some work with a guy named David Messick and, uh, and it's called Ethical Fading. That's where the theory comes from. As far as the methodology, uh, we did focus groups throughout the army at different ranks. And so we uh, did focus groups with captains, which are junior officers at Fort Benning. That's where you get the infantry and armor. Those are the combat arms. And we also went to Fort Lee, Virginia, where you get the support captains. We, so we did junior officers there. We did majors. Those are mid-level, mid-career officers at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. And then we got senior officers at, back at the Army War College, where we got colonels and uh, lieutenant colonels. But we also went to the Department of the Army and the Pentagon, where we talked to staff officers there. So it was focus groups, discussions within those focus groups. Yeah, it sounds like it was a really interesting study. So you point out in your study that lying in the Army is not a new phenomenon. In 1970, the U.S. Army War College published a study showing that lying in the Army, for the same reason of too many requirements, was pervasive. Yet the digitization of the Army, as well as the downsizing going on in the organization, have made it worse today. Is that right? That's correct. I, You know, one of the ways to dismiss this study is to say, this has always been going on. Why are you making a big deal of it? Well, it has been going on, uh, but I had to ask myself, have things changed? And I think things have changed. First of all, the army is like a compulsive hoarder. It collects requirements. It just keeps adding requirements and it never gives any up. Nobody ever says, you know what? We need to trim back on this. Uh, we always add more because there's always a, a good idea. So we keep adding to the pile. And uh, so things have gotten worse as far as requirements. Uh, the other thing is, is that technology has made an, a, a, hu a huge influence on this because before, without email, without uh, the internet, we couldn't reach down to individuals. Now we have the ability to ask an individual to do online training. Now we have the ability to say, sign this with your digital uh, access card. And now we have the ability to monitor with a dashboard at high levels, what exactly is going down on, down to the very individual level. And the last thing that changed since the past, besides uh, the cumulative effect, the technology, is also that the Army has had a giant emphasis on being a profession, on that uh, we are a profession. We develop our own leaders. We, we have to earn the trust of society. And that's been a good thing. But the other thing that the focus on the profession has done is it's made us believe that we are better than we are, that we forget that we're humans. We forget that 
we're talking about people who who can fall to the same temptations, who can go the same route as an ordinary human. And sometimes we forget that when we have all the self-talk on the profession. You've said that the army has an audit culture, but so does American society as a whole and other federal agencies in particular. In most federal agencies, one can clearly see this same explosion of requirements, many of which are often not well connected to the putative primary mission of that agency. Very interestingly, you've observed that folks in the Army are so overwhelmed by requirements that they have to prioritize, and that that word carries a lot of meaning. And I wondered if uh, you'd elaborate a little bit on your use of the word prioritize. Sure. Uh, One of the ways to ethically fade something, and when I say ethically fade, that means you take away the moral aspects of it. You take away any implications that it's an ethical decision. Instead, you make it a decision that uh, is void of all the baggage that an ethical dilemma brings. And so one way to do that is use an euphemism. And prioritize is a great euphemism to use instead of I lied. And what prioritize means is while I looked at all the requirements, and I know I can't physically do all of them, it's impossible, so I won't do these, but I'll report that I did all of them. We sort of leave that second part out because it's unacceptable to report that you didn't do them. Uh, So prioritization means, well, I'm taking risk, but the risk is is that uh, we didn't do it, but I'm going to still report that it was done. And so it's, it's the prioritize is a convenient way to convince ourselves that we haven't lied. Yeah, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Um, so what are people lying about? <laughs> and is the lying consistent across all ranks of the army? Is it more in the combat units or is it across all levels of the organization? This is an important uh, aspect of the whole study is because what this study isn't saying, this study isn't saying is that we have Uh, an institution full of liars. This isn't saying that we've now created uh, a cohort of people with uh, low ethics. Uh, No, what this is saying is that we've created an institution with a bureaucracy that has a system that is putting an onerous burden on people to do everything and report that they've done it. And what that does inadvertently, it creates this culture that we have to tell the system what it wants to hear, otherwise something won't get done. For example, in the old days when I wanted to go on leave, when I was in the Army, um, I would put in a Department of the Army Form 31. And that basically says, I want to take off from these days to these days. And uh, and that's all I had to do. Today, when you want to go on leave, you have to turn in your Department of the Army Form 31, but you have to turn in a vehicle inspection. You have to turn in, uh, a lot of times you have to turn in, I, I've completed all my medical requirements, like I've been to the dentist for the past year, I've been having my health checkups, you have to complete uh, something called a TRIPS report. And that's a travel reduction, uh, travel risk uh, program that's done online. And what TRIPS does is it asks you, so where are you going? When are you stopping? Did you get a good night's sleep? You on any prescription medications? Who's traveling with you? And what you learn is that you can't tell TRIPS online that I'm going to drive to Indianapolis, I'm going to do it with Uh, by turning up the radio, singing loudly, and having two monsters beside me. You can't tell it that. You have to tell it, I'm stopping every two hours. Uh, I will get a full night's sleep. I will stop at every rest stop, and I'll put my mother-in-law in in the back seat just to make sure. Uh, (laughs) You can't tell it that. And so what we learn is, if you want to go on leave, you have to tell Trips what it wants to hear. That's what we've created in the Army is, uh, it's not just accomplishing mandatory training. It's we've surrounded ourselves with a compliance and audit culture where we have to tell somebody, tell the system that something has happened that really hasn't. Hmm. And it's uh, these kind of things are typically for the benefit of CYA. Yes. Well, that's one way of looking at it. And it's Uh, the wrong A that gets covered. (laughs) Well, but don't forget, you won't find an evil person responsible for this. It's all a well-meaning person who said, you know what? We we can't afford to lose soldiers dying because they fell asleep at the wheel. Um, And so someone said, hey, if we came up with an online program, we could ask them all these questions. Then, well, well, the question is, is is this the best way to accomplish what you want to do? And because we've had a lot of uh, instances where it's well-meaning and yet the system we create forces people to lie to it. And maybe forces isn't the right word, but encourages people to lie to it because a soldier just wants to go and leave. Mm -hmm. That's all they want to do. These often seem, these uh, procedures and box checking often seem to be a 
a uh, replacement for what used to be handled by leadership. And that's the essence of uh, what this study came to, is that uh, in the old days, like I said, when I wanted to go on leave, uh, when soldiers wanted to go on leave uh, in the old days, uh, we wanted to make sure they got enough sleep. We wanted to make sure they had money for the return trip. We wanted to make sure that they had enough leave days uh, stored up to do this. But we didn't do that with a system. Mm-hmm. We, do that, we did that with a supervisor. And if the soldier didn't come back, we didn't go to the filing cabinet and say, pull out the form. We went to the supervisor and said, what do you mean you let him go on leave? He didn't have a plan. You you should have checked his vehicle. You should have checked this. We don't want to replace leadership with a process because Mm -hmm. the process will always tell us what we want to hear. A leader might not. Now, we can't always trust leaders because leaders are human. And that's where we we tend to say, I I prefer the process because the process gives me a green light, tells me everything's fine but it's not telling us the truth. Hmm. It's really interesting. Just an aside, when I was at Duke University, I was on the institutional review board there for seven years. And I have had these same conversations about, you know, um, every time something came along, even not specifically at Duke, but just in the healthcare medical research realm, um, it meant that we were going to get 10 more forms to fill out (laughs) with about 50 more checkboxes. And you learn quickly what the IRB wants to hear. Exactly. And so you'll promise anything after a while. (laughs) Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. This uh, growth of procedures, I'm not talking about the Army, I'm talking about society in Mm -hmm. general. And a lack of discretion left to leaders uh, almost presumes uh, poor leadership, poor judgment. Uh, and and I, I think it's a step in the wrong direction. Relying on people is messy. Mm-hmm. But they let us down. That's they what let leadership's us down. about. It, that's right. what leadership, and that's what makes it hard about being a leader. You have to work with people. And it's so much easier to look at a dashboard and see all the metrics, see all the, uh, you know, are we a go on this? Yeah, we're all a go. Well, getting down with dealing with people's lives, but that's what the military is about. Right. Society talks about personal responsibility, which is a great thing. But in the military, it's personal responsibility plus leadership. Mm -hmm. And we grow leaders, so we shouldn't be ashamed to use leaders. But at the same time, we can't expect leaders to be perfect, and we can't expect their people to be perfect. That's right. Talk about storyboarding a little in the Army context, what it means in that realm, which is, you know, different than the typical uh, meaning of story building in the commercial context. And uh, how does it fit the context of your study? Well, storyboard uh, emerged as a common example during these focus groups. And what a storyboard in the Army is, is after an event, uh, and it came from the combat operations, uh, after an event, uh, Someone had to, usually in the old days, they'd come back and brief the intelligence officer on what they saw, what happened. So the next patrol, the next uh, person to go out would have a, uh, a record of what happened at that location or that date or whatever. Um, and so instead of the old briefing the intelligence officer with technology, it now allows us to create a PowerPoint slide um, with a template uh, that has pictures, that has a map, that has a narrative of what happened. And it soon became a burden to junior officers as they came back from a patrol, as they finished an event, they had to spend time making this storyboard look like it was supposed to look. And so you stop focusing on what happened and start focusing on making the storyboard look correctly. And so it created and encouraged people to copy and paste or people to ignore the storyboard because they knew no one ever uses this anyway. Uh, so uh, they would either omit it or they'd make them duplicated or they fabricate them. And uh, now the storyboard is also a good example of the, the detrimental aspects of what's going on is that when some people hear what I'm saying, they will say, oh, yep, we remember that in my unit. We did that exact same thing. But other people that are hear this right now are aghast that someone lied on a storyboard because storyboards are intelligence and intelligence is important and you're talking about people's lives and that's what happens when we ignore this issue is that we allow people to draw the line on where they think what they think is acceptable and what is not and a lot of people thought lying on storyboards was acceptable and a lot of people thought that that was ridiculously out of line so lenny we've already touched on this but we're just going to circle back for a second um technology has improved our lives in in many ways and as an engineer i'm sure you have an appreciation for that 
Yet you also advocate for less technology and more human contact, particularly at the leadership level, as a way of overcoming the problem of dishonesty and lying in the Army. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Certainly. Uh, Now, when I started these focus groups, I didn't come out and just ex- ask people directly, do you lie? Uh, what I talked about was, you know, tell me about all the requirements placed on you and how do you deal with it? And people, when you get a group of army people together, one topic they can always talk about is the deluge of requirements <laughs> placed on them and how nobody gives them enough time to think on their own. And they wish that people would just leave them alone and let them lead troops and get the mission done. Um, but so we'd go into that. But then after a while, I'd say, so uh, what did you report about all this? And right then it got really quiet because then people started understanding where the conversation was going. And then finally I got them to say, yeah, I lied. And part of that difficulty in recognizing that they indeed did not tell the truth is that there's many things that allow them to think that they did tell the truth. And technology is one of them because the the further you move away from the lie, the further you move away from a statement um, that you know is not truthful, uh, it allows our mind to rest at ease. And technology allows us to do that. What do I mean by that? Well, in other words, if I had many people say, if you ask me a question, I would tell you the truth. And I say, I know that. I trust everyone in this room. And I would tell them this because I know you would never lie to me in person. But I said, but I know you'll lie on a form. And so for an example, uh, one thing uh, that goes on in the army is uh, we do ratings, evaluations every year on everybody. And with that rating goes what we call the support form. This is a list of all the objectives and what I hope to get accomplished in the next year. Well, you're supposed to use that form to counsel the rated officer or rated non-commissioned officer uh, when the rating period starts. But you're also supposed, to, also supposed to counsel them quarterly. Now, everyone's very happy when you get that initial counseling, but it's really, really hard to follow through with quarterly counseling. And yet that form has to be turned in and you have to show that you counsel them every quarter. And what happens is when you go to turn in the form and you turn in the paperwork and you say, I didn't get to counsel the person, the clerk will look at you and say, I need you to fill in those dates. And then you'll say, I didn't counsel the person. I need you to fill in those dates. And so what they'll do is they'll go in the other room and they'll come up with the dates. And what they'll agonize over is not the fact they're about to put their initials beside something that's untrue, but they'll agonize over making sure they pick the right dates to make sure it doesn't fall on a weekend (laughs) because that would be an unbelievable lie. And so then they turn the paperwork in and tens of thousands of these forms are turned in every year and nobody gives a second, a thought to the fact that we made up dates. Uh, and it was a lie. Mm -hmm. It was just doing business. Hmm. That's uh, really, uh, easy to believe. Yeah. It ring, it rings true. (laughs) Well, I'm hoping people who hear this aren't sitting back in judgment of the army. No, no, and no. And saying, no. oh, thank goodness we're not that way. Because I think if you really look at it, no, it's this cultural. is pretty it's cultural. common. It's this cultural. cultural. Yeah, absolutely. In many agencies and companies, and most particularly DOD, PowerPoint has become the de facto communication tool. And uh, PowerPoint can obscure the paucity of thought that often underlies a particular slide. And, um, you know, in NASA, we used to have a saying that uh, this guy was one slide deep. And so if you, you know, drilled in on one of his slides, you found there was nothing underneath it unless he had the smart guy next to him. You know, he could ask the smart guy. And um, there was a former NASA administrator uh, who uh, used to uh, tell his critics that your PowerPoint rocket will always be better than my metal rocket, <laughs> you know? And, and so I, th- I wondered if you'd uh, talk a little bit about PowerPoint. Sure, the uh, PowerPoint is a, a double-edged sword. It's, it's perfect for, uh, for briefings when used correctly, but it's very dangerous when used incorrectly. And the danger of PowerPoint is that we reduce all the detail, that we reduce all the uh, uh, ambiguity in the status of something to, in the army, we reduce it down to a color. So if it's green, then our attention can move away to something else because everything's fine. If it's amber, okay, a little. Uh, If it's red, well, you'll never see red because who (laughs) in the world would ever brief red on a briefing? Someone's in deep trouble. And that's part of it though, (laughs) is that you never wanna go in and, and brief red. And so you're always going to brief Amber, we're fixing it. Here's what we're doing to fix it. Okay, I feel better. Or green, mostly green. And so it gives the wrong impression, but it also allows us to hide behind the color. And Mm -hmm. it allows the 
the leader, the supervisor, the, the decision maker uh, to get off easy by not knowing the details. But it also allows the briefer to get off easy by, by saying it's green. Mm-hmm. And and it, it gives the impression that there are no defects. It's a zero defects. Uh, we're a hundred percent, and very few things in in the real real world are a hundred percent. Yes, Jeff Bezos famously banned PowerPoint and Amazon as a low information uh, communication medium that often supports the illusion that the presenter actually has a coherent position or argument. You know, you've got just bullets instead of uh, carefully structured text. And uh, I think that might be part of the problem. Do you, Lenny? It is. It's uh, PowerPoint, when used incorrectly, uh, is a lazy man's tool. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but when used correctly, I live by PowerPoint, so I'm not about to abandon my PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, um, you should. When used correctly, yeah. it's, uh, it's a good uh, stimulus for discussion as opposed to the conclusion. Yeah, we used to, uh, this is in another NASA story, which may not endear me to my friends, but uh, we used to endeavor, it was like a contest to see if you could get your bullets at least two levels up in the organization on that guy's PowerPoint. <laughs> That's and success. It, it was like a huge win. Well, we, we actually have uh, tongue-in-cheek patches in the Army that say PowerPoint Ranger oh, yeah. on them. <laughs> That's so. awesome. <laughs> you know, this seems this seems to be you know we're talking about the army and NASA, but it's there's this is again a broad issue, and we just mentioned Amazon, but there seems to be a growing appreciation of the PowerPoint issue, and uh, and this is of course not limited to this particular product. We're talking generically here about presentation packages. Uh, in Switzerland, there's actually a Swiss political party called the APPP. The Anti PowerPoint Party. We we need this in America. Uh, the uh, they they would do well in this election. That might be the third yeah. party they're talking about. They could they could <laughs> win? Uh, uh, the APPP is dedicated to this is from their language to decreasing professional use of PowerPoint and other presentation software, which the party claims causes national economic damage and lowers the quality of our presentation in 95% of the cases. Now, I don't know how they came to know this, but I find it on the face plausible. <laughs> I'd like to see their slides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll present them in PowerPoint. <laughs> or no, they'll use Keynote, then they'll be okay. Right? Oh, that's, I was trying to figure out how they're going to present that information. So. <laughs> So, Lenny, another area where people often lie is in training compliance. Can you talk a little bit about this? Sure. Training compliance is usually the most commonly uh, used example. And uh, because in the Army, we have uh, a large amount of mandatory training that needs to be done. A lot of it's online. A lot of it has to be done uh, in auditoriums. Uh, and I'm talking about things like sexual harassment, uh, equal opportunity, uh, benefits of an honorable discharge. Mm-hmm. Um, you name it. Uh, I just had to do one on constitution day believe it or not and uh and each one by itself says it it makes you think okay i don't really need this but okay i can see how they do that but you put them all together and it becomes it trivializes the training and that encourages uh people to view it as in the army the most common expression is dumb (laughs) if it's a dumb requirement then i rationalize it away by saying you know I can lie on this one because I'm restoring sanity to the system. I'm balancing the scales of justice. And this requirement deserves to be lied to. Uh, the Marines give an example. They, uh, every Marine has to take a smoking cessation class. And we're talking about people who have never smoked in their lives mm-hmm. and they still have to do it. At, uh, this past year, we had to take a class on fetal alcohol syndrome. Oh, boy. Uh, my wow. kids are grown and gone, yeah. and I still had to do that. And so that's when you get in your mind, it's like, this is a dumb requirement, and that sort of helps me. I'm not admitting to anything, but it sort of helps <laughs> me breeze through that kind of training. Right. Yeah, too many of these requirements are seen by the folks in the service as tangential at best to their primary job and sort of corrective with respect to their uh, personhood. I found it offensive. I was in the Navy. You know, they made me take this class as all of us. And it was a long time ago. Some of you will remember. There was a famous book, a soft cover book called 
I'm okay. You're okay. <laughs> and this guy was a real fluffy dude. And he comes in and he says, no, I'm okay. And he says to me, and I was supposed to say to him, you're okay. And I, I would say, no, you're a jerk. And uh, <laughs> th this didn't go anywhere. And I never got invited back. And all the others were jealous. They said, how come Ken doesn't have to go anymore? <laughs> He's not okay. He's not He's okay. Not okay. <laughs> now, the, danger of all these tr the danger of all these trivial examples that we have, though, is when you add them all up, it creates a culture. Yeah. Yes, it does. And that it culture does. spills over. Yeah. So it spills over to uh, when you go downrange, which I mean, in mm -hmm. combat, they have to turn in reports. Well, there's some reports that are really important, like troops in contact goes over the radio, uh, casualty evacuation, goes over the radio, everything stops, that's to happen. But also there's some of the reports in there that people view as dumb. How many of these do you have? How many of these do you have? And because of this culture we've created, mm -hmm. we give them permission to lie about the, what they view as dumb. Mm -hmm. And again, the problem is, is who decides what's dumb? For one person, they say, that that's not dumb. Mm -hmm. that when, when a weapon goes off inadvertently, what we call a negligent discharge, why should we report that? Because it was an honest mistake. No one got hurt. Other people hear that you you lied on negligent discharges. That, are you, that's a breach of discipline. You need to do an investigation on that. Well, that's what we've become. Who gets to decide? Mm -hmm. And then you start the slippery slope of where does it stop? Which So that leads into my next question for you. So what's worse, the lying or the pervasive perception that it's not in fact lying, the idea that we're above lying? It's The lying is a problem. But that problem can be corrected. If we don't admit that we do this, then we head into hypocrisy. We head into hubris. And that's more of a problem. Uh, we could always correct the lying part, uh, but we, we will struggle for a long time to correct the culture if we don't start working on it. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. I'm going to circle back around again. Um, talk about ethical fading. You mentioned in your report that it is also influenced by the psychological distance from an individual to the actual point of dishonesty or deception. We've talked about this a little bit before, but can you give another example of that and talk a little bit more about this? Sure. Uh, an example of this, uh, well, what the ethical fading is, is uh, you remove the uh, glare of the bright colors of moral decisions. You, you make it so it's not black and white, right or wrong. You make it so it's it's gray. It's not a, it's not a moral decision. It's not an ethical decision. Uh, and so one way to do that is to, uh, is to numb us by asking us to verify or, or uh, show compliance with something over and over and over again. And so what happens is we start psychologically disconnecting from the ethical part of it. An example of this is uh, every year to use the computer systems in the army, we have to s sign a statement that says, I have read, understand, and agree with the information assurance uh, policies of the United States Army. And preceding that is a 1900 word document. Every single person initials that. Mm -hmm. And I haven't found a single person that has read that yet. Now, the Army's not alone in this. You know, in the UK, they did an experiment where they offered free Wi-Fi. And the first requirement was you had to say, uh, I promise to give my firstborn. <laughs> well, they had to stop that because every single person signed up for it. And it's because we become numb to it. Because yeah. we don't think we're lying to a person anymore. We think we're just lying to a system. We're lying to a question on a, on a form. And that distance allows us to say, it allows us to convince ourselves that we don't lie. Yeah. And like you said, it's it's a totally different thing if you're talking to a person face to face. You, talk to you, a person. you wouldn't lie to them. But, and you also yeah. get people, some people who say, you know, I'll lie to a person in authority. Uh, but if when their staff comes talks to me, mm -hmm. I'll give them a seventy percent answer because <laughs> they're not they're not important. Right. So when does a little white lie become something more serious? And that's what we have to remember is that we could talk about all the trivial humorous examples all day. Uh, but there are also some examples that aren't so trivial. And uh, those are things like when a, uh, a battalion commander related the story that he had to inspect 150 polling stations in Iraq. This is when the elections were going to happen. He had to go inspect them all to make sure the security was okay. 
It was physically impossible for him to visit every single polling station, but he was given an Excel spreadsheet and he had to fill it out. And he said, I filled it out the way they wanted it. Hmm. That's when it gets serious. It gets serious when uh, units were training Iraqi units for years on proficiency. And when they, the unit would show up with their partner unit, they'd have to grade them. And they usually would grade them at amber or red saying, okay, they're not great, but we're going to work on them or they're in trouble. But when that unit left to rotate back to the United States, that Iraqi unit was always green. Hmm. And so you add up all these Iraqi units that were graded green, and we had a very good Iraqi army on paper. And then we saw what happened though, when ISIS came in, that suddenly all those green units didn't perform the way all our PowerPoint slides said they would. So you were once in the army yourself. Do you remember feeling pressured by all the requirements that we've been discussing? I remember feeling pressured, but not to the degree that they feel today. Yeah. Um, because we didn't have the technology to check on me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I didn't have to report so much. I didn't have any online training. And if they herded us into an auditorium, uh, I could sleep. Uh, <laughs> but it still existed. I remember my early days as a brand new second lieutenant uh, at Fort Belvoir, Virginia, they uh, put us all in a big room and it was my first army physical. And uh, the docs were up front and they were having us fill out our form. They said, block one, put your last name, block two, put your first name, block three, put your social security number, block 12, state your current physical condition. And then they'd say, right here, I am in excellent physical condition. <laughs> and so we all wrote down, because we are new, <laughs> I am in excellent physical condition. For an entire career, I wrote that down in block 12 because I always thought that's what you're supposed to do until I took my retirement physical. And then it was time for to say, no, I'm going to tell the truth on this one. But I had been conditioned to tell them what they wanted to hear in block 12 for an entire career in the army. <laughs> yeah, the, your study is in some ways sort of uh, brave. And uh, uh, did people in the army react negatively to this? And was the reaction in any way rank uh, correlated or rank dependent? Well, that's that's an interesting question because that gets very, it, it was very eye-opening on the reaction. Uh, First of all, I'm at the age now where a lot of my peers are decision makers, senior leaders uh, in the army. And so I can get cards and letters from them. And what I started getting was uh, a lot of anger, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, how could you do this? You've attacked our profession and uh, you're just trying to make a name for yourself. And this is the last thing the army needs. But on the same hand, I started getting emails and calls and notes from people throughout the army saying, this is an open secret. We live this. This is not a big deal. It's you've just exposed what everyone knows about. Right. So it was revealing to me that the force said, we knew this was going on, but senior leaders have a hard time acknowledging it because who wants to acknowledge that the profession that they grew up in, the profession that they helped build, the profession they were successful in mm -hmm. has these flaws. And we have a tendency to romanticize the past, to think that we were the one person that didn't succumb to these pressures. Uh, you add to that fact that the more senior you go in, in an organization, the less you have to comply with all of these trivial requirements. Mm -hmm. If a senior leader wants to go on leave, they turn to their assistant and say, put me on leave. I'm taking vacation days. They don't sit down at the computer and say, I'll knock out my trips now. Uh, I'll do go, get someone to do my vehicle inspection. They don't have to do that. So they don't have a true taste of what people are undergoing today. And so I got that from the senior leaders, but after a while they stopped reading the headlines and they, and they read the report and they realized this isn't an attack on people. Mm -mm. It's not about senior leaders behaving badly. This isn't saying we are unworthy people. No, this is saying we've created a culture and now you're starting to see policies change. And so to see policies change because of a, 34 page document, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be part of that. Hopefully there's a discussion going on in the army saying, let's not create, let's not add to this culture where people have to lie to the system to get something done. You know, the military has a track record of leading the way in a variety of cultural changes. I mean, you can, you can, you could list a quite a long list and, uh, it would be great if this was one of them because the problem is much broader than the military. The military reflects the culture of which it's part. Yeah. 
That's correct. We are, we are just a mirror of society. That's right. Uh, but the army is also a profession. Mm -hmm. And professions are experts. They're trusted by society. They develop their own. But they also police themselves. Healthy ones do. Right. And so if we could ignore this problem and someone else like Congress will come in and fix it for us. Or we could take it on and say, we need to change this. Uh, let's, let's change this from within instead of without. That last uh, thing that you just said uh, must be highly motivating to senior leadership because Congress is well known for fixing things uh, skillfully and quickly. Right. And so <laughs> <laughs> and we don't need that. <laughs> So, Lenny, you've mentioned that there are three things that the Army could be doing to improve things. Can you talk about those three things? Sure. The first thing we need to do is acknowledge the problem. Uh, we are, uh, the Army is a, a profession uh, with people of uh, high morals, uh, but it's also human. And so let's acknowledge that, that we have these pressures, that we, uh, we've created a system that inadvertently uh, abets the very behavior that we're trying to ward against. Um, and let's uh, acknowledge that uh, at all levels this happens because then we could start addressing it. Um, that's the first, acknowledge the problem. The second thing we need to do is exercise restraint. It's something that we, uh, we've created that every level in the Army loves to create requirements for those below it. Well-intentioned, um, but we need to let those on the bottom exercise their own judgment. We let them make a decision. And so let's stop telling them what to do, how to do it and allow some leeway. Uh, now, that'll be some, there'll be some cost to that. At the senior levels, you might have to tell a constituent that we can't add extra training on bath salts because we have too many other things on the plate. Uh, it, it might uh, not provide the uh, plausible deniability when things do go wrong because we don't have a piece of paper that says yeah, everyone took training on that. Uh, so it, there might be a cost but we need to do that. There also has to be some exercising a restraint of, uh, at the lower levels, where I, uh, at the lower levels, we can't have those who are doing the briefing, those who are turning in the reports. Uh, they, they have to exercise restraint in saying, Look, it's really doubtful that you guys are really at 100%. Um, and that leads to the third thing, that we have to lead truthfully. So uh, lead truthfully is instead of looking and evaluating decisions after the fact, we should just look at before it even happens, saying, am I lying on this? And do I need to lie? Uh, for example, at the Army War College, we uh, have uh, academics there that uh, need to go to conferences for, for professional development. And uh, unfortunately, the GSA went to Las Vegas and had a really good time out there. And, and uh, people got upset about people going to conferences. And so in the Army, we have to turn in uh, permission. And uh, at the Army War College, we had to go to the joint staff, the J-7, to ask permission to send people to an academic conference. And so our provost at the Army War College wanted to send two people to an academic conference. This study had come out, and he said, you know what? Uh, when we ask permission, we have to say that it's mission critical that these people go to the conference. And he said, this study says that we shouldn't have to lie to get things done in the Army. And he, so he sends a note to the J7 saying, I've got two people who want to go. They really need to go for professional development, but I'm not going to lie to you. It's not mission critical. The Army War College will continue on living without these two people if they don't go to the conference. The note back from the J7 was, I'm a retired colonel handling this action. We didn't have this problem in the Marines. <laughs> the second thing was, is, is it mission critical? And at that, our provost wrote back, okay, it's mission critical. So, but that's leading truthfully. Yeah. They, they said, do you want me to lie? Um, and I'm not going to lie to you. It's not mission critical. And they forced it back on them. Now, the, the way that story ends is they changed the policy. You no longer have to say it's mission critical. You just have to say, these are good people. It's important for them to go. They need it for professional development. Because someone in the system realized, why make them say it's mission critical when it's really not? Right. Right. That's a nice, uh, a nice example. Yeah, it's a really nice example. And it's, this has been really interesting uh, just because you can see so much application. Like you said, it's not just within the Army. This is every organization I've ever, not IHMC. But uh, <laughs> say, every uh, other organization. Every other organization. Yeah. Let, <laughs> let me know when you have to do it. <laughs> Tell him what he wants to hear. <laughs> uh, IHMC is unique in that fact. But, yeah. but large organizations that I've worked with or been affiliated with in the past, um, you've seen this and um, it's, this has been really fascinating because I've been sitting here nodding the whole time going, yep, I've, I've done exactly what you've been talking about, whether it's, 
you know, training or whatever it might be. Um, so this has been really interesting. Yeah, I mean, you often actually make up words that don't exist, <laughs> uh, previously didn't exist, to so you're not committing a bad act, you're committing the word. So you right. said prioritize, prioritize. or yeah. in the Navy, uh, words like gun, gun decking, decking yes. and uh, <laughs> cum shine and all right. of these. And actually, I've had uh, in these focus groups, people say, that's not lying. That's good leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's an interesting state of affairs when we call good leadership lying. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, it's often seen as a, a role of a good leader in these sorts of organizations as providing high cover. Yeah. Exactly. And high cover, really, when you unpack that, means uh, in many instances that the leader uh, took the hit and right. uh, is who checked the boxes. Right. So these mission critical folks were able to concentrate on the actual mission. Right. And then we have to ask ourselves a question how did we create a system that put us in this situation? Exactly. Well, thank you for your important work on a topic of great cultural importance. And as uh, Don noted, it goes way beyond the military. It's a reflection of the culture of which the military is a critical part. So thank you. As, as an American, I appreciate this work. It took some courage to do it, actually. It's my pleasure chatting with you. Ah, uh, likewise. Thank you so much, Lenny. STEM talk. 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 I really enjoyed talking with Leonard about his eye-opening research. Absolutely. Really interesting guy. And I think it's important to note that Leonard's work should not be seen as a criticism of the Army or its people, but rather of the ever-increasing, ever-advancing audit culture, coupled with more requirements than can be reasonably expected to be accomplished. This leads to pencil-whipping or gun-decking these requirements and little by little, it diminishes the integrity of the force. Yeah, very well said. If you enjoyed this interview as much as we did, I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where you can find the show notes for this and other episodes, in addition to a link to a video of Leonard's evening lecture, stemtalk.us. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.